morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Welcome to this day the Lord has made. We are going to have a great time being in the presence of the Lord. So glad that you could be here with us. A special welcome to those of you who may be new. We're, uh, I'm Pastor Mark. If you don't know who I am, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And if you're brand new, we'd love it if you'd fill out one of these welcome cards and turn that in to either one of the ushers or in the offering box. That's one way that we can connect with you and answer any questions that you might have. A uh, special shout out to those of you who are with us online as well. We're so glad that you could join us today and that we pray for God's blessing upon you as well. If you brought a, uh, an offering, uh, we thank you so much for your partnership in the ministry here. There's two boxes, one on the way out in there, and then on the side over here, you can leave that. You can also put prayer cards or anything else, uh, communication that you would like to share with us. As the service concludes today, if you would like to have Holy Communion, we welcome you to come forward after the uh, postlude, and uh, we will share the elements with you at that point and uh, share Holy Communion. We will also have uh, prayer partners available that can pray with you over here in our parlor, and if you would like to have personal prayer, just make your way over there, and then someone from our prayer team with a lanyard will come and pray with you. If you haven't uh, got the email yet, uh, we, are, oh, we have a new church directory that we're going to be putting together in September. I'm excited because that helps me get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we really would love to have everyone be a part of that. You don't have to buy anything. You just uh, get your picture taken and it's great. So if you got the email, there was a link on that that you can use to sign up for the times or in September. There's also, uh, Carol Lake is in the Narthex. On the way out, you can sign up at the table over there and she can answer any questions that you might have. Hope that you can all get your picture taken for that. Also, just a reminder that Hope Fest is this Saturday, downtown Prescott from 8 to 4. I think we got our booth covered as far as the, the people, but I encourage you to come check that out. What a great way for us to reach out into our community. And then a week from Saturday, if you are interested, uh, we are hosting a CPR uh, training session. And if you would like to know more information about that, there's information in your bulletin or you can contact the church office. Also, just wanted to mention that uh, several people have been asking how we can support those in Maui uh, that have gone through such a terrible experience this week. And I know that Thrivent, uh, if you're a Thrivent member, you can, uh, they have a matching grant that you can utilize to help those victims in Maui. Uh, I know that I'm sure there are literally dozens of other ones that you can connect with, but I think that's the way that we would encourage you to share uh, in the recovery process for them. In fact, let's lift uh, that up in our worship time in prayer right now. Lord in heaven, we thank you for another beautiful day that we can come into your house, come into this worship space. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our time of worship. We pray for those who are going through times of crisis and times of difficulty around the world. We lift up in particular those who were victimized in Maui. We pray for your grace and support. We pray for the assistance that they need to rebuild and to be restored. We pray that you would guide us in our part in how we can do that, as well as we reach out to those in our own community. We pray for a blessing on Hope Fest this weekend, and that it would truly be a blessing to those in our community community who need love and support. Thank you, Lord, for the generosity of this congregation. Thank you for the ability to help and to bless and to reach out in Jesus' name, for it is in his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand right now and greet those around you as we begin our time of worship.
today in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of creation, we are in awe of your power in our universe. We see the start that you have created. We see billions of sons testifying to your majesty. We hear your word that enlightens us and brings us closer to your perfection. We are led to tell others of your perfection. When we consider what you have done for us, we can but adore you while praying that you will use us to bring others to you. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, Lord of the ages, in our busy lives, we do not always make time to love, to pray, or to sing your praises. We want to be strong, yet we often feel out of control, buffeted by the winds of change, rocked by the earthquakes in our relationships, burned by the fires of doubt. Forgetting what we cannot see, we ask, why have you forgotten me? Help us trust your presence, even when we feel utterly alone, trapped in our dark night of the soul. With the promise of Christ as our hope, lead us from our own wilderness of wanderings into the well-tended garden of your life. Let us silently confess our sins. Amen. The steadfast love of God is with you, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Whether you turn away or doubt, whether you follow timidly or joyfully, you are loved and forgiven in Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
seated. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 56. This is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed at that moment. The word of the Lord. You, you may be seated. And now, our psalm of the day, Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. And so that is our psalm for today. And when I think about what season we in, we're in, it's a good season. It's finally not 90 and 100 degrees, you know. I'm not sweating every time I walk outside. But the best season is fast approaching, football season. <laughs> you know, the pre yes, thank you. You know, football season is fast approaching. It's the best time of the year. Sundays only get better, you know, with football. I, as you guys know, I'm a huge Vikings fan and I love sports. I love everything about sports. I love the camaraderie, the teamwork, the dedication, the sacrifice that everyone makes, right? From the coach to the players to the training staff, everybody makes a sacrifice to achieve the same goal, winning a championship. Everybody working in unity. And my junior year in college was the best soccer team I've ever played for. That year, we were ranked as high as number three in the nation and ended up finishing top 10 in the nation. We went all the way to the quarterfinals of nationals and ended up losing in a double overtime game. And what I learned from that season is how everyone has to be on the same page. Everybody working together as one team. Everybody making the sacrifices to achieve the same goal. All the players, all the coaches, and all the training staff working together as one, united as one team. And the definition of unity is this, 
the state of being united or joined as a whole. Unity is something that is not easily achieved, and that's what I learned in that season, especially in sports. There's ego, there's pride, and especially those what we call divas, right? They think it's all about them. They forget that it's about the team. It becomes individualistic and they think about themselves and they don't think about the whole. But when we think about it, that's us as well as Christians and us in the church as well sometimes. The struggle to work together as a unit, as a single unit with unity, working in perfect harmony to further the kingdom of God. You know, we struggle with our egos. We struggle with our pride and our sins. We're not willing to make that sacrifice to further the kingdom of God. You know, in my 30 years of life on this earth, I've seen churches grow and fall apart because they're not willing to work together as a one unit, as one team, as a unified church. You know, it becomes all about the pastor or it becomes all about the worship team or it becomes all about this one thing and they forget about what matters the most and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is what matters the most in church, in ministry, and everything that we do in our lives, it must be focused and centered on Jesus. It's all about him. And when we look at this Psalm today, Psalms 133, It teaches us the power of unity when God's people, they come together centered on Jesus Christ and Jesus as their focal point. And the amount of amazing things that can be accomplished when we become one. And this psalm is a short one. It's only three verses long, but it talks about one of the hardest things, being unified as one. David, the author of the psalm, had a very tough life as a teenager. David was anointed by Samuel as a teen, and he would go on to achieve many amazing feats. Like he would go on to kill Goliath and win many battles, but those victories led to jealousy from King Saul. King Saul would go on and try to kill King David multiple times. Therefore, David was on the run for many, many years, running from King Saul for his life. A span of 15 years from the time David was anointed by Samuel to the time he was finally anointed to become king of Israel. 15 years. He was on the run for many, many years. And scholars believe that this psalm, Psalms 133, was written when David finally becomes king and he unifies the kingdom of Israel under his kingship. And so let's go ahead and dive, to this, dive into this psalm, starting with verse 1. So follow along as I read it. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Now, in the NIV translation, the translation that we're using this morning, there's actually a Hebrew word that is not translated in this version. And that word is Behold. Behold is the very first word in this psalm. So if you have a pen or a pencil, I want you to write the word behold before all of this verse. So it goes something like this. It says, behold, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. David is saying, look, marvel at what I'm about to tell you. It's so important that David is bringing extra attention to what he's going to say in this song. And he's saying, God's people living together in unity is good and pleasant. Now in this first verse, these two words stand out, good and pleasant. When we look at the Hebrew words for good and pleasant, we get a deeper meaning and a deeper understanding of what David is trying to say here. The Hebrew word for good is tob. The definition of tob is good, desirable, excellent, agreeable, or beneficial. In other words, it's good in God's eyesight. God has put his stamp of approval on unity. Unity is good in God's eyes and it's desirable. 
God desires that his people is in unity. But also, God's people should desire to be in unity with one another. And then the Hebrew word for pleasant is na'im, which means pleasant, delightful, lovely, or happiness. Not only is unity good in God's eyes, but it's pleasant. It's delightful, it's lovely, it brings happiness when God's people are united as one. It's pleasant for the individual, but it's also pleasant for everybody else. And this is important because being good and being pleasant at the same time doesn't always happen. Some things are good, but they may not be pleasant. Or some things are pleasant, but they are not good. For instance, I don't like eating green vegetables. So I don't like eating lettuce, spinach, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, any of that yucky green stuff, get it off my plate. All right, it's good for you, but for me, it is not pleasant whatsoever. Doesn't bring me happiness. You know, I'm more of a steak and potatoes kind of person, chicken and rice, that's what I love. That's what brings me joy and happiness. Or my absolute favorite snack is hot Cheetos. All right, it's, it's pleasant for me. I get happiness out of it, but it is not good for you whatsoever, all right? There's no beneficial nutrients in hot Cheetos whatsoever. But for me, it's very pleasant. And so those are just some very simple examples of not everything is good and pleasant in life. And when we just sit and take, when we take a second to think about it, there's a lot of things that we encounter on a daily basis that's, that might be good for you, but not pleasant. Or it might be pleasant for you, but not, might not be good for you. But David is saying, when the God's people come together, it's good and it is pleasant. It's good in God's eyes. It's good for your soul. It's good for you spiritually. It's something that you should desire. Also, when God's people live in unity, it's pleasant. It brings you happiness. It's delightful. It's lovely. Living in unity is good and pleasant. Well, how do we live in unity? How do we achieve this unity that David wants us to have? Well, the answer is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 to 6. Paul says this. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Well, how do we live in unity with each other? Well, we do it with humbleness. We do it with gentleness. We do it with patience. But most importantly, we do it with love. Paul names these four things, humbleness, gentleness, patience, and love. That's how we enter unity with one another. It's with these four things that we are able to achieve peace and live in unity as one unit. And as we continue to look at the passage, the word one is used seven times. Seven times the word one is used. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. It emphasizes the unity that Paul is teaching to the Corinthian church that the vision that is among the Corinthian church, Paul is saying, let it stop. Be humble with each other. Be gentle with each other. Be patient and show love to each other so you can be one, so you can be united with each other. And then in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, Jesus says this to his disciples. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus gives his disciple this new command to love each other like how Jesus has loved them. 
And the way you show love to your neighbors and to each other, that's how people are able to tell that you are a follower of Jesus. That's how, able, that's how people are able to tell that you believe in Jesus Christ. They know you by the way you love, not by the way, not by how much you know the Bible or how many Bible verses you've remembered or how many songs you know. It's by the way you love your neighbors and the way you love others. That's how people know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's all about love. And when I read the Bible and when I read the scriptures, especially the gospel, it's all about love. To live in unity with each other is to love each other how Jesus has loved us with humbleness, gentleness, and patience. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, it shows a perfect example of God's people living in unity with each other. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to, one, to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is a perfect example of God's people living in unity. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. They enjoyed fellowship with one another. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They provided for those in need. They worshiped together, praising God for everything that he has given them. And what did God do in return? God added to their number on a daily. People were being saved because God's people were in, were in unity, serving God, preaching the gospel. And that leads us to the next section of this psalm, verse two and the first half of verse three. So follow along as I read that. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. What we can learn from this section is that God is the source of unity. David uses two images here in these verses. The first one is, it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. Now this imagery is very important, and so we're going to break it down by its key elements. And the first key element is the oil that is poured on the head. It's not just any oil, but it's the oil that is poured on Aaron's head. And so we find our answer in Exodus chapter 30, verse 22 to 33. So follow along as I read that. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much, that is 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon, 250 shekels of fragrant calamus, 500 shekels of cassia, all according to the sanctuary shekel and a hint of olive oil. Make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the Ark of the Covenant Law, the table and all its articles, the lamp stamp and its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils and the basin with its stand. You shall consecrate them so they will be most holy, and whatever touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour on anyone else's body and do not make any other oil using the same formula. It is sacred and you are to, and you are to consider it sacred. Whoever makes perfume like it and puts on anyone other than a priest must be cut off from their people. You know, we just read that this oil is a sacred oil. It was not an ordinary oil that they used. 
It was a sacred oil used for anointing Aaron and his sons and his descendants, consecrating them so they may serve as priests. This sacred oil was used also for the tent of meeting, the Ark of the Covenant, and all the things that went with it. All the things that were considered holy was anointed by this sacred oil. And when this oil was poured on Aaron's head, it was to show that he was holy, that he has been consecrated to serve God and God's people as their priests. You know, sometimes when we think of the word holy, we think of someone or something that is perfect in everything that they do, right? Well, that's not really what's happening. Holy has more to do with being set apart for God's purpose, the Holman, the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary defines holy as this. The biblical use of the term holy has to do primarily with God's separating from the world that which he chooses to devote to himself. As God's redemptive plan unfolded through the Old Testament, the holy became associated with the character of God's separated people conforming to his revealed law. When the time became ripe for the saving work of Jesus Christ. His redeemed people came to be known as saints, literally holy ones. The cross made this possible by inaugurating the fulfillment of the preparatory Old Testament teachings on the holy, opening the way for God's Holy Spirit to dwell in his people. To be holy means to be set apart, to be separated from this world, to be completely devoted to God and his kingdom being formed to God, being used for God's purpose. That's what holy means. Aaron was set apart to be holy. And David, in this psalm, is saying that as God's people, we are holy as well. That we have been set apart, that we have been separated from the world so that we can be formed by God so he can use us for his purpose. We are to be completely devoted to God and his purpose. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God calls us to be in unity. God calls us to be one, to be used for God's purpose. And we cannot fulfill God's purpose unless we are in unity, unless we are one. If we live in discord and division within our neighbors and within the church, we cannot fulfill God's purpose that he has called us to. We cannot be a blessing to our neighbors and to each other when we live in discord with each other. And so that is why we need to be in unity. Only in unity can we fulfill what God has called us to be, the purpose for our lives and the purpose for this church. And then when we go back and look at this imagery again, it says, it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard down on the collar of his rope. Twice, running down is used. And then a third time, the word down is used by itself. The imagery is that it starts from the top and then it runs down and it continues to run down. And God is the source of our unity. It begins and starts with God and Jesus Christ. God is the source of us living together in peace and harmony with one another. And Jesus is the center and the source of it all. We cannot have unity unless it's founded in Jesus Christ. It's only when it's founded in Jesus Christ that our egos and our pride disappears and we focus on what God has called us to. John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23 says this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. 
I love this passage because it shows that Jesus is the key to being united with our heavenly father and that he is the key to being united with each other. What we see from this passage is the perfect unity that is found in the father and the son. And to take it a step further, it's the perfect unity that is found in the Trinity between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There in the Trinity, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's a perfect unity, perfect harmony, perfect peace, and perfect love. Three persons in one God. And we see from this passage that Jesus desires that his followers share in that unity with each other and share in that unity with God. And that is why God is the source of our unity. It begins and ends with Jesus. And then when we look at the second imagery, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Now Mount Hermon was in the northern part of Israel, along the border of Lebanon and Syria. It is the highest mountain in Israel at about 9,000 feet above sea level. It's known for its cool nights and heavy dew. And compared to Mount Zion, which is located in the southern part of Israel, Mount Zion is only about 2,400 feet above sea level. So we have two very different mountains. Mount Hermon receives a lot of dew and moisture. Mount Zion receives little dew, rain, or moisture. And David is saying, when God's people are united as one, it is, it is as if the dew of Mount Hermon is falling on Mount Zion. Dew gives life, and it gives the surrounding environment life, healthy and thriving. It becomes a renewal, a refreshment. The trees and grass are fertilized, and it can grow. And it's the same for us as well as the people of God. When we are united as one, when we are united, we are refreshed, we are healthy. There's a renewal in our faith, a renewal in our spirit, and we can grow. It is as if Mount Hermon is God pouring out his blessing to us here on Mount Zion. And then as we finish this Psalm, looking at verse three, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forever. God pours out his blessing when his children live in unity. And that's what we've been talking about all morning long, living in unity with each other because that's where God pours out his blessing. When the people of God are united as one, great things can be accomplished. At the beginning of my message, I mentioned how churches fail because there's a division, there's a discord when their focus is not on the right things. Our focus needs to be on Jesus Christ and how we can be and how we can be used to further the kingdom of God. We need to have a change mindset to change me to we. It's not about me and my things. It's not about my needs. It's about Jesus and how we can serve and worship him and how we can be there for each other as the body of Christ. Naturally, our human nature is to focus on me, myself, and the things that I need. But we need to change that mindset from me to we. You know, maybe you need to ask for forgiveness from a friend or a church member. Or maybe you need to be the one to forgive that person. Or maybe you're going through a tough time and you need support and love from others. And so you need someone to pray over you and to be that love and support in your lives. Or maybe you're ready to serve and be plugged in at church as a volunteer, as an usher, maybe working in the altar guild, volunteering in Sunday school. As a church, we need to be of one heart, one soul, one mind in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit working together, as, working together to further the kingdom of God. That's what God has called us to be, to be one mind, one heart, and one and one soul working together for the kingdom of God. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day and we just thank you for showing us how to be in unity with one each other. 
We pray that you will give us the humbleness, the gentleness, the patience, and the love to achieve that unity that you have called us to. We know that it's only possible when we focus our eyes on Jesus Christ as our focus point. We pray that this church and its members will be united as one so we can achieve the great things that you have planned for this church. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I invite you to stand for our song of the day. I believe are some of the strongest words we can say. So let us share together what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord, we come before you today to present our tithes and offerings to you in faith. We believe your word and we honor it by putting our faith in action through giving. We thank you for your blessing and we believe we will have what you promised. On this day of rejoicing, we pray for the life of the church, the world, and all in need. Lord of all holiness, unify us in truth and love for one another and give each and every one of us a willingness to look for ways to honor you by serving in our congregation and in the community. Out of gratitude, we seek to glorify you in every possible way. As the body of Christ, unite us in purpose so that we are able to be a powerful force for good in the world. For the spirit you gave us does not make us timid, but gives us the ability to accomplish great things in your name. Hear us, O Lord. God of all provision, we pray for Corey Jamison and Tony White who've been hospitalized. Quicken their healing. We also pray for all who are burdened by the problems of the world. Lord, you have promised that you will work all things out for the good of those who love you. We lift up those whom we know are feeling weak, discouraged, and helpless. May their temporary sufferings be repurposed for your glory. Hear us, O Lord. Prince of Peace, we lift up all who work for peaceful solutions to the world's problems. We ask you to quench 
the fires of rage and hatred in men's hearts. Bind us together in love and compassion. Help us to see others as you see them and remind us to be gracious in our dealings with others regardless of how they treat us. As much as it depends on us, may we live at peace with everyone. Hear us, O Lord. Joining our voices with your faithful ones in every time and place, we offer our prayers in the name of the risen one, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Just a quick reminder, if you want to receive Holy Communion today, please come up to the front um, after our last song. Also, if you're looking for prayer, our prayer team will be in the parlor over there. And so now, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and share their love. Amen.